Hello, and thank you for joining our webinar series in 2020 with the Healthy Aging at Tufts Priority, Priority Area Research Group. This webinar is um, moderated by Dr. Alan Taylor of the USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University. Am I on now? You are on, Dr. Taylor. Okay. Um, I was going to say that I'm delighted to introduce and meet Dr. Louis LaPierre as our guest speaker in our Healthy Aging and Tough, at Tufts seminar, but I'm not less happy because I was having such a good time talking to him before the conference that I wanted to keep talking, but I'll have to share him with you now. I think you're going to find the seminar really thrilling. Um, this may be uh, maybe my second meeting with, with Lewis, but I think last time there may have been too much beer after the conference at the Cold Spring Harbor for us to remember um, each other. But before I continue my introduction to Dr. LaPierre, I'd like to call to your attention um, that Mitch McVeigh from the Medford campus of Tufts and I will host a course on the biology of aging in the spring 21 semester, 2021. We'll cover theories of aging and really exciting newer research on the biology of aging. We'll start with the theories of aging and move to specific emphasis on roles for protein quality control capacities during aging. These are going to include formation of aberrant proteins and removal of them by the ubiquitin and autophagic proteolytic pathways. We'll do short dives into diet and immune capacities in aging and a variety of other topics that will be so integrated to the concepts we spoke about just before. Then we'll spend the last sessions peering out to the future, covering efforts to prolong health and delay aging. And we'll have the sessions peppered by talks with a variety of luminaries who've already agreed to speak. Now I'm gonna go back to Dr. LaPierre. And the reason this was appropriate for me to interject the introduction to the course is because I think Dr. LaPierre is basically going to give us this whole course in just about 45 minutes and his interests span all of the topics that I spoke about already. He did his PhD in biochemistry from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He studied links between lipoprotein metabolism and the ubiquitin system. He then moved to the Stanford Burnham Institute in San Diego um, in, in Malene Hansen's lab and um, studied how autophagy and lipid metabolism interact to modulate lifespan. He's been extremely successful in getting his laboratory funded. He received an K99 award uh, to independence, re an in a K99 award for independent research to initiate his lab. He's got an R01, he's got a junior AFR. He was awarded the Glen Aging Research Award. Um, and most of his lab focuses on C. elegans. Um, I think now he's going to take you for a tour of the variety of proteolytic systems and show you how, in fact, these can be harnessed to hopefully delay age-related problems. Dr. LaPierre, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, is my screen on? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for the nice introduction and for the invitation for this seminar series that is regrouping a lot of a leader in aging. So it's, it's really uh, an honor to be part of this uh, group. Uh, I uh, started my lab in 2015 at Brown, and we've been interested in this process of autophagy, this rejuvenation process. Uh, as you may call it, uh, that takes uh, material inside the cell and, and, and recycles it uh, for the cell to continue to thrive. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about this process, how we're finding new ways to modulate it, and what it means in the context of aging. So as you've seen probably in the past, uh, there's many nice model organisms to study the aging process. Uh, we have the yeast here that we know is about two to three weeks for reprodu reproductive aging, uh, replicative aging. We have C. elegans that we use a lot in the lab. Uh, this nematode is living about three weeks as well. Uh, the uh, fruit fly is about two to three months. Uh, this new model by the Brunei lab um, uh, that was developed a few years back is the killifish, about four to six months. Uh, the mouse, of course, uh, but that makes for a long lifespan studies. And this uh, really uh, neat uh, model of naked mole rat, which lives up to 30 year. I think at this point, this is kind of the average. So super long lived. So all these model organisms 
uh, they have helped us understand the biology of aging. Uh, and uh, one, one of the key things that we're, uh, uh, the reason why we're using C. elegans in the lab is that biology is well established, but also it's a really quick way to understand how gene might modulate lifespan. Uh, there's a lot of advantages to use the system. So again, there's a lot of conserved mechanisms. It's got a short lifespan. It's genome sequence. It's biology is well understood. The lineage of all the cells is understood. Um, the whole genome is actually covered for silencing library. We have RNAi for each of those genes. Uh, transparency, you can do fluorescent microscopy, and uh, it's an established genetic system. You can do uh, a screening mutagenesis, uh, and there's reporters and mutant libraries available. And I want to emphasize uh, another thing about uh, CLGAN's research, which is great, is that the community is quite collaborative. We have a well-curated database called Wormbase. And also, you can purchase uh, for about $10 any mutant you kind of like at the uh, CGC uh, library. But, but also, if you go to Worm meetings, uh, you recognize that this is a pretty unique community that's quite collaborative. And so, um, you know, if you're interested in working with a worm, um, you can find anybody that works on it, and they'll be happy to collaborate. Another thing that's good with the worm is that it was really instrumental in developing the field of genetics of aging. And that was initiated in part by Cynthia Kenyon's discovery of a gene that actually modulates lifespan. That gene's called DAF2. It's a, the insulin uh, IGF-1 receptor in humans. And, and what the DAF2 mutant does, well, so when DAF2 uh, function is down, is that it extends lifespan uh, up to twofold, but uh, to be honest with you, I've worked with those uh, animals. They can go up to 100 days, which is amazing. It's more than three times the maximum lifespan of wild type. So they're really amazing worms. They live super long. But what's interesting is that the one, only one transcription factor when it's uh, uh, not working, the DAF-16 the DAF transcription factor, or called FOXO in human, when it's lost, you lose all that lifespan extension. So it's a critical part of the longevity mechanism. And so there's a transcriptional activation that needs to happen. And so when the studies of C. elegans were pursued after Cynthia Kenyon's discovery, there's a lot of different components of insulin signaling that were kind of uh, ironed out. Um, we understood that it was a, a kinase uh, cascade, which uh, led from the insulin signaling to the phosphorylation of that DAF16 transcription factor. And by phosphorylating the transcription factor, you prevent its nuclear translocation. And so you prevent its function, which leads typically to the activation of gene that extends lifespan and some effector mechanism. And you know, continuing working with C. elegans, a lot of different cofactors and regulatory mechanism were laid out. And so there's a lot that we know about DAF16 uh, FOXO. And there's a lot that we know about longevity generally. So it's, you know, this discovery is over 25 year old now. There's a lot of things that have been figured out as far as the effector mechanism that leads to longevity in C. elegans. And those uh, are conserved in other systems as well. One of it that's our, our interest in the lab and has been a long standing interest in uh, Melina Hansen's lab as well is the enhanced autophagy and lysosomal function. So we've, we found that to be important for several and most of longevity models that we work with. We also found a lot of key transcription factors that were found in the nucleus, suggesting that to create those enhancement in effector mechanism, you need to have transcription factor at the nucleus activating the transcription of genes. And also one thing that has been dear to my heart is the altered lipid metabolism and signaling that seem to be pretty evident in these animals. So altogether, they create the condition that are conducive for longevity. So what is autophagy? So autophagy, again, is this, is this uh, cytoprotective uh, rejuvenation process, which take which you consider trash in, in the cell and, and recycles it. So it takes micromolecules that might be damaged or organelles and then breaks it down through the lysosome. And the lysosome is great because it has all these degradation enzymes. And so when this double membrane vesicle called an autophagosome fused to the lysosome, it can degrade all these components and these components are exported and reutilized by the cell. And so it kind of cleans out some of the damaged micromolecules that can be detrimental uh, later in aging. So several proteins have, have been shown to be involved in autophagy. We're talking about over 30 proteins. So if you think about that process and how you enhance it, one thing that you have to be able to do is to increase the activity and well, often the expression of those proteins coordinately. So there's a stoichiometry that needs to be met for the process to be enhanced completely. 
So you have components in the initiation, nucleation, phagophore formation, and so on that needs to be upregulated for the process to be able to augment and increase the degradation of components. One of the components that we're going to talk about a bit in this talk is this ATG8LC3 conjugation system. This is a small ubiquitin light protein that is found on a tophagosome and leads to uh, the formation of an interface on which receptor can bind onto and create some kind of selectivity for the cargo. And it's modified here. Uh, so in CL again, it's called the LGG1 or LGG2 proteins. So why do we care about autophagy so much? It's dysfunctional in, the, in the, a lot of diseases that are really relevant in the context of aging, neurodegeneration, cancer, and myopathy and heart disease. And one of the things that has been uh, emerging in the field is, is the recognition that a lot of those diseases have a lysosomal storage uh, uh, dysfunctional component. And so that the whole autophagy process is, is inhibited because the lysosome is unable to deal with oncoming cargo. And the discoveries of all these proteins that we were mentioning before was, uh, was made by Yoshinori Osumi, which got the Nobel Prize in 2016. This was one of my uh, last uh, live conference. I got a chance to get a selfie with him. So how do you transcriptionally regulate the whole process? So uh, discoveries during my postdoc were made in mammalian cells where um, that's transcription factor called TF, uh, transcription factor EB or TFEB, uh, was discovered to be uh, enriched in promoter regions of genes that are involved in autophagy and lysomal function. And so it's, it was deemed a, a major uh, regulator of the autophagy process, but in particular, a major regulation of the coordination of the upregulation of genes involving autophagy. And so these are two different situations you can uh, see in cells where there's a lot of nutrients. You're gonna have the mTOR pathway that's activated. So mTOR is a nutrient sensor that senses in, in particular amino acids that comes in. So when there's a lot of nutrients, there's a lot of amino acids. mTORC is active. mTORC C1 is one of those complex that can regulate TFEB by phosphorylation. And it, when it does so, uh, when it's active, it leads to the nuclear exclusion uh, of the protein by making it more susceptible to bind to 43.3. So it sequesters it in the cytoplasm. But in the context of low nutrient, uh, mTORC C1's activity is down and the phosphorylation doesn't happen as often. TFEB is free to go into uh, the nucleus and activate genes that are involved in autophagy. So when I, I work in Melena's lab, uh, we were interested in figuring it out how is this happening in C. elegans? Is there a TFEB ortholog? And so I did the most basic thing we can do is blast the TFEB sequence in the C. elegans genome and figure out if there's anything there. And HLH30 was the top hit for that uh, um, homology. It's quite homologous. Uh, although not all phosphorylation sites that are regulated by mTOR, for example, were found when we did some phosphoproteomic studies with the Fegerman lab in Denmark, we found that one of the key mTOR sites might actually be conserved. So it seemed to suggest that the mTOR regulation of HLH30 might be conserved as well. So we continued studying that. To study HLH30 in CLNs, we uh, collaborated with the Irazaki lab that was at Harvard at the time, now it's at UMass uh, Worcester. And uh, they were working on HLH30 in the context of immunity, and they had this HLH30 GFP reporter. And so we crossed it to a long-lived animal to try to figure out if HLH30 uh, localization inside the animal might change. And we used the GLP1 model. It's a germline less animal, so temperature-sensitive mutant of the protein Notch1. And when we looked at the animal under the scope, it was clear that there was nuclear enrichment of the protein uh, by looking at the GFP signal here, and you can see in the insect there. So there was, it was promising. It suggested that HLH30 is enriched in a site where we know its activity might be relevant for autophagy. So we look at ortholog of uh, the genes that uh, were regulated by TFEB from the uh, uh, 2009 and 2011 uh, studies by the Balabio group. And we found that most of those genes were conserved in C. elegans. And so they are involved in all different uh, parts of the autophagy process from autophagosome formation to uh, cargo degradation. And they all seem to have this clear e-box motif that seems to be preferred by TFEB. So it suggested that regulatory uh, uh, sequences were conserved as well. And when we look at the GLP1 animal in, uh, in comparison to the wild type, as far as the expression, 
of these autophagy related genes, we saw that most of those genes were upregulated. And so it suggested that HLH30 might be involved in inducing these genes. But to really directly uh, answer that question, we went for a GLP1 HLH30 mutant. So we used a, a mutant of HLH30 and crossed it to GLP1. And we saw that most, but not all of those genes seem to be HLH30 dependent. And so they gave us a, a kind of sense that uh, the autophagy process uh, that is uh, transcriptionally induced in these animals goes through a transcriptional regulation through HLH30. And so we asked whether functionally the autophagy process would be effective. And so the, there's quite a bit in this study that's published in, in Nature Communication and that we use these early uh, stage um, reporter for autophagy. Uh, but this reporter came out in 2017 from uh, Melina Hansen's lab, which is a tandem reporter, which leverages the uh, uh, pH sensitivity of GFP uh, to look at the uh, formation of a two lysosome, which would give us a sense of how much autophagy at a particular steady state is happening. So this double fluorophore with the GFP and mCherry allows you to see the LGG1 protein, which is this uh, ubiquitin-like LC3. Uh, GABARA protein. Uh, when it's forming these punctate structures, um, it's representing autophagosome. And when uh, the autophagosome fuses to the lysosome, it turns into only red signal because the GFP uh, signal is lost as uh, in the low pH of the lysosome. And so comparing those amounts and those level of green and red gives us an idea of how much autophagy might be happening. So, uh, so we have quite a few of those um, early stage reporters of autophagy in the paper, but we tested those recently, but looking at uh, heat stress uh, for autophagy. So another way to enhance autophagy is to uh, use the heat stress. So this is unpublished work by uh, Shikwan Wong, a uh, postdoc in my lab. And what she found is that if you heat stress the animal at 37 degrees for four hours, you do see an increase in uh, uh, a loss of the puncti formation in the autophagosome. So these autophagosome gets processed. So there's a quick processing of these autophagosome. And there's still a lot of these autolysosome present after four hours in the context of just a wild type animal that has functional HLH30. But you lose that ability to create those autophagosome when you look in the HLH30 loss of function. So even there's a little bit of formation of autolysosome in that context, but we're starting with much lower amount of autophagy happening at steady state in these animals. So this supports what we saw uh, in our publication, whereas autophagy functionally was um, affected by the loss of HLH30. And so the next logical thing was to look at a lifespan in different long-lived animals to see if it actually has a meaning. Is the autophagy induction actually important for these animals? And we saw using RNAi in adult only, in GLP1, but also in the long-lived uh, DAF2 animals that I talked about earlier we saw a requirement for HLH30, but no effective wild type. And so we look at other longevity models. We have a series of them that are well established in the worm, some that are affected the, the mitochondrial respiration, uh, uh, the ribosome or mRNA translation, or reduced food intake by using this uh, pumping defective E2 mutant. And they all required HLH30 to a certain extent to extend lifespan. So this, HLH30 protein seems to be one of the first uh, uh, very common lo uh, longevity associated transcription factor in C. elegans. And we also looked at mTOR inhibition. So as I suggested, the mTOR regulation of HLH3 might be important. We knew in the past that mTOR inhibition by RNAi extended lifespan. So you can see it through the dark blue here uh, with TOR RNAi. But that effect of mTOR inhibition on lifespan was lost in the HLH30 mutant. So if you silence TOR in HLH30 mutant, you can't extend a lifespan anymore. So this showed that it was a very common transcription factor for longevity. And then we went into mice, so dietary-restricted mice, and I worked with a colleague at the SOC that was in the Dillon lab at the time. And we looked at liver of the mice to look at TFEB levels. We saw increase in DR of the expression, but also the nuclear localization by doing nucleocytoplasmic partitioning was an increase for TFEB. And there's something with mice that's important to recognize is unlike what we've seen in the worm, and, and that's something that I think is emerging in the field, you don't need the full population of transcription factor to be enriched in the nucleus to have a transcriptional activation. So there's some competition that might be happening in the nucleus and a little bit of increase in the nucleus as far as the concentration of transcription factor might be able to outcompete those sites for transcriptional activation. So it seems to be conserved. 
And uh, this is a study that I put here with uh, uh, two colleagues, Brian Foslow, that was at the Scripps at the time, and Christian Reidel that was at Harvard, but now at Karolinska. So when I was doing that study, what we recognized is those autophagy targets were also regulated by uh, DAS16 and also FAFOR, which is another transcription factor in bone longevity. So, so we had some clues that perhaps the HLH30 work with other transcription factor to increase the expression of those genes. And so what Brian did is was doing these co-IPs with DAS16 GFP and he found HLH30 bound to it and Christian followed up that story. So uh, I was fortunate to work in San Diego. I just basically grabbed a coffee with Brian. He was telling me about this cool protein he found on an IP. And then that project just basically exploded. And so they published the story in 2018. But as you can see, this is something that lasted about five to six years to try to understand how these interactions were happening. So this is a story that came out in Nature Communication a couple of years ago. What they found is that DAF16 and HLE should be interact in context dependent manners. When we uh, completed our study, we came up with this uh, review figure to kind of encompass what we knew at the time of the regulation uh, transcriptionally of uh, autophagy and how that mediates longevity. And uh, we put the mTOR uh, uh, pathway in as a, a negative regulator of that process and perhaps actually even affecting FOXO's transcription uh, capacity uh, by phosphorylating it. Uh, and so these are the components that I showed in the study. And uh, also a part that I don't talk too much about, but that's emerging and being important is the chromatin state as well. It has to be coordinated to allow the transcription to occur. And so one question that, um, so before I go to the next uh, section, I wanna see if there's any question for the first part. People can feel free to ask a question now for this part, just to be sure that you're on board for the next part of this voyage. I, I'll ask one question that as you talk about the HLH and DAF16 inter, interaction being context dependent, and could you just clarify that context? So when they, uh, when they did the study, what they found is that only in certain circumstances, they see the interaction and they see a meaning. So when they do chip seek, they see that in those contexts, you see both DAF16 and HLH3 at those promoter sites. And so they, they, they tested in different contexts. It also, the nuclear localization of those transcription factor varied in different types of stress. So they seem to be um, stress-specific uh, transcriptional signatures. Okay, thank you. And I guess we're ready for the next part of this. Okay, so the next part, so we wanted to, so I, you know, I studied at the, at the Burnham Institute and one of the things that they were really pushing for, it's a cancer institute, they do a lot of drug discovery. So can we find exploitable processes that can develop into uh, pharmaceutical uh, options for enhancing autophagy in the, in the context of our research program? So that's something that I kind of got raised into when I was in San Diego. So we decided to take TFEB as a potential target for enhancing autophagy, trying to find modulator of its localization. If we can find gene that can modulate the localization, maybe those are targetable and we can uh, enhance autophagy that way. We also were interested in finding targets or drugs that were not affecting TOR localization, uh, TOR activity, because if you affect mTOR activity, there's um, still some uh, side effect that might happen because it's such a master regulator of uh, nutrient sensing. So we wanted something more specific. And so we did the, the typical things that you do with the RNAi and CLGANs. You plate, you synchronize those eggs, you put them on different types of RNAi. So we did that in 20,000 different RNAi, so there's, imagine 20,000 different plates seeded with RNAi. We put this HLH3 GFP worm on it, and we look for animals that had changes in their GFP signal, but also in particular, nuclear localized HLH30. So we're looking for genes that when you inhibit, leads to the enrichment of HLH30 in the nucleus. And we found this protein called XPO1. It's an ortholog of CRM1 or ex, uh, exportin1 in humans. And XPO1 is a nuclear export protein. So what it does is it carries cargo from the nucleus outside into the cytoplasm. And it does so specifically because those cargos have nuclear export sequences. And so it seems to be a really interesting target to be able to control the localization of HLH30. If you inhibit the export of HLH30, you just enrich the uh, transcription factor in the nucleus. And that concept was really interesting for us too, because I think uh, for the most part, when you read those studies about transcription factor, they don't account for a lot of dynamic between cytoplasmic and nuclear 
pools of transcription factor, they think that they might actually just sit there. But there's a lot of dynamics. So what we saw is if you inhibit the export of transcription factor, you will get rapid enrichment into the nucleus, suggesting that the pool between the cytoplasm and the nucleus is really dynamic. And so this is the image, you know, in development in adulthood, we saw this polka dot looking worm uh, uh, during development when we grew the worm on RNAi. So suggesting that you could see enrichment in both contexts. Um, and we look at the gene expression, you know, this is the logical extension. We want to see if HIH30 is active. Uh, and we saw that different uh, LC3-like proteins and also the selective autophagy proteins that I will talk about a bit more later was enhanced and also lysomal lipolytic genes were enhanced as well. So suggesting that we uh, see an increase in what we would think is HLH30 function. We also saw functional enhancement in XP01 uh, rna eyed worm when we look at the pharynx and also the, um, the hypodermal cells of uh, worms expressing this uh, tandem reporter. We saw an increase in the autophagosome and autolysosome levels that were HLH30 dependent. And similarly, we saw an increase in hypodermal cell uh, autophagy. And those were two sites we took uh, on because they were uh, the most highly expressed uh, site for the protein. So they were the cleaner uh, to actually look at. So we also look at lifespan. And so we expect that if you enhance autophagy, you might extend lifespan. And we did that many times, over 12 times we did these lifespan and we saw lifespan extension that were robust between 15 and 45%. And so this, again, those are bread and butter in an aging, C. elegans aging lab, you do a survival analysis uh, with time. And so that was clear that there was an impact on uh, longevity when you enhance autophagy. Uh, we look at requirement for HLH30, so uh, to, um, to see if HLH30 indeed was driving this longevity effect, we couldn't see a lifespan extension when you knock down XP01 in those HLH30 mutant. If you uh, had a mutant of autophagy process, you also couldn't extend lifespan. So autophagy seemed to be critical for that. Again, we published a story in Cell Reports in 2018. Um, and uh, we further asked the question, is XP01 RNAi extending lifespan in long-lived animals? And what we found, so if you look at the right side, we found that the expression of XP01 was downregulated in long-lived animals. So what you expect to see if you silence is maybe not too much of an effect because XP01 activity is down already. And that's what we saw. We couldn't extend further lifespan in all these different models, suggesting that XP01 reduction might actually be a mechanism that's a, a common mechanism by which these animals can retain transcription factors into the nucleus and elicit those transcriptional signature that are extending lifespan. And so fortunately with this project, when we follow it through, we wonder if there were compounds available that could inhibit XP01. And they were. Uh, there were the classic leptomycin B, which was an irreversible inhibitor of XP01 that was uh, known in the field for a couple of decades, but also this company in uh, Newton that uh, started making these KPT type compounds, which were selective and a reversible inhibitor of XP01. And so we tested those, we tested four of them, I'm going to show you one of them, the KPT-330 or Selinexor that was FDA approved earlier this summer for uh, cancer. The reason why it's used in cancer for, in that context is because XP01 uh, expression is increased in a lot of cancers and tumor suppressing protein are actually carried out of the nucleus by XP01. So inhibiting XP01 can improve uh, uh, other cancer drugs uh, effect by uh, reducing proliferation. And so we had to go to high concentration in the worm, but that's pretty common. The worm is refractory to a lot of drugs. And so we had to go up to 100 micromolar. At 25 micromolar, we start seeing nucleolization. 25 micromolar is around the range that the uh, drug uh, screening in the worms are happening. I think it's between uh, 10 to 30 micromolar usually. Uh, so we were right in the range and uh, we wondered if it enhanced autophagy as well. Uh, and so uh, the sign number one is the KPT-330 as well. Uh, so when we use 50 to 100 micromolar of that drug, uh, we saw enhancement in pharynx and seam cells at the hypodermis, uh, suggesting that autophagy could be enhanced uh, with those drugs. And we also look at lifespan. Although it was not as good as the RNAi, we saw lifespan extension between 15 and 20% with the uh, concentration ranging from 25 to 100 micromolar. And so we had a colleague upstairs, just one floor up, that's doing some ALS studies. And uh, so we're interested to see if in a model of neurodegeneration, we can improve uh, the survival by enhancing autophagy with these drugs. And so we used a SOD1 mutant. It was with the uh, collaboration with the Re uh, Rob Reed in the uh, lab upstairs. And we tested whether the drugs would work. 
and they worked. Uh, surprisingly, I'm not showing the data, they work mostly in female versus male. So sorry guys. Uh, but it extended lifespan uh, significantly and suggested that we could enhance uh, some proteostatic process there that would improve uh, the, uh, uh, the, the disease. And so uh, we wondered if that was going uh, to be conserved up into human cells. So we use HeLa cells. And so there's an interesting story about these two papers. So we actually submitted our story to Nature Communications and it was desk rejected. So it's a nice story about rejection. And we sent it right away after that to cell reports and it was accepted within a few months. While our story was accepted in cell reports, these two stories came out like about like three to six months later. So Nature Communication was interested in that type of story, just not us. That's too bad. Uh, but they basically showed very similar things that we showed, which that the TFEB is actually uh, regulated by uh, uh, exportin one And what they found is that not only TFEB is regulated by phosphorylation in the cytoplasm, but also the nuclear export sequence has some adjacent phosphorylation site that can be regulated by mTOR. And so that mTOR regulates it both ways and can regulate its nuclear localization that way. So that's a story about dealing with editors. And when we tested the KPT compounds, what we found is that they were nuclear enrichment in all these different KPT compounds. Uh, not as much as TOR in one, which is the TOR inhibitor we use here for TORC1, but uh, they, 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 were, they were a good uh, increase. And uh, we wonder if it affected autophagy. So we started looking at the level of these autophagy protein I was mentioning before, particularly the LC3 uh, ubiquitin-like protein. And uh, typically with torin one we see an increase in LCD3-2 in particular. When we use these compounds, we saw an increase in all of these different uh, forms of LC3, some that are more involved in uh, representing the mature autophagosome in some of the early stage. Uh, we did some studies in neuro 2 a as well because we're interested in neurons, and we saw the same effect for these compounds. And also what we found is that if you block um, with baf BAFA, so you block the lysosome, you see a further increase. So these... Um, uh, th these compounds do enhance autophagy uh, generally. They also increase lysomal biogenesis. So when we look at lysomal biogenesis using lysotracker and we use TORIN1 as our positive control, we saw that there were a nice increase in signal in lysotracker. So, and that, you know, goes back to the idea that you have to be able to coordinate the process to be able to have active and, and uh, efficient autophagy. So you have to enhance some of the proteins early in the, uh, in the process, but also you have to enhance the lysosomal capacity to be able to deal with those incoming autophagosomes. And uh, just a sanity check in our study, we did TFEB uh, knockdown to see if the uh, lysotracker signal would go away. And so you can see here in the inset that the GFP signal is gone in these TFEB GFP expression cells. And uh, you can see that there's uh, uh, an inability of these uh, cells to fully recapitulate the enhancement in lysosomal biogenesis when TFEB's there. So it seems that TFEB was the main contributor in this uh, activation. So finally, I talk briefly about the fact that we're interested in things and drugs that were not affecting mTOR. And so we look at mTOR phosphorylation as a proxy for its activity. Again, we're using TORIN1 as a, a, a positive uh, control. We saw that uh, phosphorylation of mTOR was decreased and that phosphorylation was maintained during uh, the, uh, the treatment of these drugs, these different KPTs in the HeLa cells. So suggesting that mTOR is still active and that's important because we're trying to reduce some of the effects associated to mTOR regulation. And also uh, this demonstrates that this is a new entry point for modulating autophagy through uh, the nucleocytoplasmic partitioning of the transcription factor. So it seems that XPO1 is a conserved modulator uh, for TFEB activity. So we came up with this review slides, uh, which gives us a bit of a, um, I guess, you know, 30,000 uh, feet pictures of what we think is happening in the cells is that XPO1 level to an extent will dictate the nucleocytoplasmic partitioning of a lot of proteins, but specifically proteins such as TFEB that would be now at low level found in uh, the nucleus. So if you reduce XPO1 and that would improve autophagy and perhaps reduce neurodegeneration and we also see improvement in lifespan. And so you have the normal onset of aging. And actually we think that in the context of aging that proteins actually might be increased. I think it's true in the context of progeric cells, for example, that XP1 levels is high. It's also high in the context of cancer. And we think in both contexts, 
you see a more oncogenic situation uh, because you relieve uh, a lot of the cytoprotective uh, uh, transcription factors that are associated with longevity, but also you take away a lot of the tumor suppressing proteins that will reduce proliferation and you can have cancer development. And we're exploring whether it's also true in the context of neurodegeneration that XPO1 levels are elevated. And so that would, again, support that this is an interesting target uh, to go after for neurodegenerative diseases. And I'll, I'll, I'll take a break and just take some questions uh, at this point, uh, Dr. Bill. Feel free to ask a question before we, we go on to the last part of this journey. I'm going to save mine. All right, so let's go on. I'll carry on. Okay, so this is uh, some of the unpublished stuff that we've done. We have a story in preparation for this. We're trying to figure out how XPO1 modulates nucleocytoplasmic or protein more generally. And we did nucleocytoplasmic fractionation in C. elegans. You can see on the left side, we're using different uh, markers for different fractions. We have the input nuclei, nucle non-nuclear organelles, and cytosol. If we look at protein contents in the nucleus versus the cytoplasm, which contains the non-nuclear organelles, the cytosol, and we look at with time in C. elegans, what we find is that if you knock down XPO1, you see a maintenance in proteins in the nucleus through time. So you typically see a decrease in aging. So I don't think that's ever been reported that proteins leak into the cytoplasm with age uh, from the nucleus out. So, um, oh, there might be translational changes, but definitely the partitioning is changed. And so that suggested that maintaining the nuclear health is important. And so we did some proteomic analysis and I'm just giving you a bit of a, a superficial look at it that we're definitely um, thoroughly looking into those different protein partitioning right now. But you can see that not only there's nuclear enriched proteins in XP1 RNAi, you would expect that most of it would be enriched, but also you see a repartitioning in the cytoplasm of metabolic genes, for example which suggests that there is not only just a protein or proteostatic change, but also a metabolic change associated with XP1. And we're exploring that currently. So that's just a little teaser of what's coming down from our lab. There's another story that's unpublished and I'm present here. It's uh, related to SQST1, which is the selective autophagy receptor that mediates a specific cargo selection before the autophagosome is formed. So it's gonna pick up different cargos here and send it for degradation specifically. And it can go into two different suggested form. It can form these kind of agglomeration by allogromerizing with the target cargo and then bind onto the autophagosome while it's formed through binding to LC3, for example, or it's forming those very uh, mobile uh, aggregates uh, that phase separates that can uh, be recognized by the autophagosome. So we're still, uh, I think the field is still trying to figure out what, uh, whether both are existing and what, uh, how are they regulated. So two stories while we were working on this came out. We knew because I was working with Melena that there's a story on, on SQST1 that was coming out. And um, I thought it was pretty controversial, but there's another group at uh, UCLA and David Walker that showed that if you overexpress the protein, you can affect lifespan. So those story came out. And what we found when we work with the system is that, so they did all their studies at 20 degrees in C. elegans, is that when we do it at 20 degrees, we don't see much of an effect, but especially if we increase the temperature a little bit, we find that SQST1 overexpression, it does not necessarily extend lifespan and actually increasing the presence of this reporter is detrimental for these animals. We use different reporters. We, we made an RFP fusion. We use Melena's GFP fusion protein, and we also created a tandem reporter. So altogether, it suggested that it's temperature sensitive. So in case of temperature, you challenge the system and having too much SQST1 is not good. And when we did it at 20 degrees, although there's not much accumulation of SQST1, we didn't see uh, the effect that the uh, um, uh, Melina's group uh, did using uh, multiple different uh, lines and so on. So suggesting that perhaps, you know, the, uh, the uh, role of SQST1 in the context of lifespan is very context dependent. And if you challenge the system and you have a lot of SQST1, but you don't have the expression of other components in the autophagy machinery, or you're not enhancing lysosomal biogenesis, that might not be sufficient to have a benefit in the context of lifespan. And we also look at expression. I mean, these reporters, they express, uh, if you look at the RFP and GFP, they express a massive amount of uh, protein if you uh, increase just slightly the temperature to 25 degrees. We're talking about like a hundredfold. Also, what told us that perhaps 
trying to enhance the protein expression in that context might not be sufficient to enhance elective autophagy is that when we look at the ratio between the GFP and the RFP signal, which gives us an idea of the amount of autolysosome that contains SQST when it's happening using the tandem reporter, we didn't see the ratio change too much at 20 degrees. We only saw seeing the, the ratio change at 30 degrees. So when we increase the temperature, then we see a lot of these SQST1 containing autophagosome move into the lysosome. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of selective autophagy happening at 20 degrees, and that at least with our reporter. And also when we look at loss of SQST1 for affecting lifespan, we didn't see much of an effect at 20 degrees. And that's something that Malena has, has found as well. But we did see a decrease at 25 degrees. There seemed to be a requirement for SQST1 at that temperature, but you don't want too much of it. So it seemed to be a pretty much of a threshold. And, and that's system dependent because if we actually uh, lose the SQST1 in a DAF2 mutant, and that's right in line with Malena's data, we don't see an effect on lifespan at 25 degrees. So those animals are able to sustain themselves without SQST1, which is a selective autophagy process. So it was very intriguing uh, to us. So we wondered what kind of genes would modulate the SQST1 dynamic in that context to try to understand how these contexts change in different models. We used a GFP and RFP fusion protein. Again, we use the same strategy. We uh, did 20,000 different plates and look at worms that were put on those seeded plates with different RNAi from eggs up to day one adults. We found 266 modulators that led to SQST1 accumulation. A lot of them were ribosomal proteins. And so we wondered whether these genetic modifiers were related to general proteostasis. And that was important because a lot of uh, work has been coming down the pipe related to that, the proteomic analysis of aggregated protein and C. elegans were coming out. So we had like a list to look for. And also this paper that came out um, earlier this year, it's talking about the fact that proteins in the worm, the amount of protein in the worm doesn't technically change with time, but its solubility does. So it's really at the edge of solubility. So maybe some of those proteins have, just tip the edge off to aggregation. And also we looked at lipid droplets because in the context of long live animals, we see, for example, in DAF2, the animal is quite fat, it's got a lot of lipid droplets. We wonder if proteins on lipid droplets would tell us some clues as to maybe those might be related to proteostasis. And when we overlap all this together, looking at the lipid droplet proteome, the aggregated protein and modulators, we found 19 candidates. Most of them were ribosomal proteins that seem to suggest that those are a, showing a link or an interplay between SQST1 dynamic and uh, its accumulation and lipid droplet metabolism and just overall protein stability. And so these are such example here. And so a lot of them are ribosomal protein. Also gave us some clues that perhaps SQST1 is a ribophagy re receptor because if you lose stoichiometry of ribosome subunits, you're going to have ribosomes that need to be degraded. And that's where you see accumulation of SQST1. And so we asked the question if lipid droplet accumulation affects lifespans. We used the strategy of knocking down the gene that the, the rate limiting step of lipolysis of the lipid droplet triglycerol, ATGL, uh, so ATGL1 in the worm. And, uh, and that allows us to increase lipid droplet uh, mass and size. And we extended lifespan at 25 degrees by having a 20-80% uh, knockdown. But what was interesting in the overexpressor of SQST1, not only did we increase lifespan, we almost abrogated the accumulation of SQST1, suggesting that lipid droplets can stabilize the proteome and definitely affect SQST1 dynamic in that context. And we found that that lifespan extension associated with ATGL1 is not dependent on these classical uh, autophagy or lifespan related uh, uh, transcontractor DAF16 and HLGD, but it's important to have HSF1. And HSF1 is a transcription factor that's regulated by chaperone levels in the system a little bit like what we see in the context of UPR, whereas if you start having aggregation in the system, these chaperones will be recruited to the misfolded protein, and that, that, that cytoplasmic partitioning will lead to a nuclear translocation, or HSF1, because it's going to be released, and it's going to be able to trimerize and activate genes that are involved in heat shock response. So we looked into that, and we're interested also to uh, look at whether DAF2 mutants would be uh, immune to SQSC1 accumulation because they're fat. We saw that they were immune, at least in the intestine where all the fat accumulates to the accumulation. We did see some gonadal accumulation, but what was surprising is that the lifespan extension of related to DAF2 was not affected by SQSC1. 
And so we look at overexpression of ATGL1, we saw that the decreasing the amount of lipid droplets is affecting lifespan. It's also increasing the amount of SQST1 accumulating. And we wondered whether there was a, an interplay between ATGL1 and ribophagy perhaps. And so that's why SQST1's function is modulated. And so we look at this protein, this very important protein, P97 or VCP, that's involved in ribophagy and also other um, proteostatic processes. And when we knocked it down in ATGL1 GFP animals, we saw an increase in ATGL1 levels. And that was in line, that's in line with what James Olsman's shown in the context of uh, this lipid droplet uh, regulation by ATGL1 and uh, VCP. So they both compete for uh, the surface of the lipid droplet. And if you lose a, a VCP, you get also an increase in ATGL1 levels, but also an increase in SQSC1 levels. And the lifespan associated with knocking down ATGL1 is lost in the CDC 48.1 mutant. And so we wondered if, if uh, it would affect a, a ubiquitination because overall, you know, SQSTM1, one of the things that it's really good at is recognizing ubiquitinated protein in the system. I think Dr. Taylor can attest to that. He just recently published a study about P62 and the advanced glycation products and how, you know, these uh, ubiquitination levels modulate P62 dynamic. And so what we found is that, you know, when we use the proteasome subunit as a positive control, we found that you know, in these 1% and 5% uh, SDS soluble uh, fractions that uh, RPN6 knockdown increases ubiquitination massively. Well, what we found is, especially in the 5% uh, soluble, so that we're talking about proteins that typically are unsoluble, uh, so you have to add a lot of SDS in there. We saw that HEGL1 was decreasing the level of ubiquitinated protein. So we came up with this model, and we're still, it's still a work in progress, and uh, the study is, is in revision right now, as to how lipid droplets might actually be modulating SQST1 dynamic by actually changing the ability of, of CDC48 to deal with potentially ribosomal protein, because we know a lot of ribosomal proteins are associated with lipid droplets, and how that actually affects the ability of SQST1 to do its job. So if you lose lipid droplets, you might be challenging the system to do more uh, ubiquitin mediated degradation, which has to go through the proteasome and SQST1 M1. And having a lot of SQST M1 in there might not be necessarily a good thing if you don't have a lot of lysomal activity to deal with that. So they seem to be, again, an importance. And that's why, you know, the work on TFEB, I think is important here to study processes that coordinate the whole machinery to be able to drive up proteostasis and longevity. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my crew. There's three postdocs that have been working really hard on these studies. Anita Kumar, Jocelyn Nisbono, and Chi Kwan Wong, and also a slew of undergraduates that have been super helpful and supportive. We also have collaborators at Brown and elsewhere on proteomics and lipidomics work and the funding. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I find myself applauding in my little cubby that I'm working out of. But um, I am sure that everybody else is as well. Um, well, I'll give you a minute to catch your breath while I look at the questions. We have several questions. Um, Mary Wallenford is, asks, um, in addition to autophagy, which you clearly focused on today, in addition to autophagy, TFEB has been shown to regulate endocytosis. Have you examined endosomes for endocytic cycling in these models? That's a really good question. We haven't explored that part, but definitely what we found is uh, TFEB is regulated by endosomal dynamics. So we have other targets that do affect endosomal cycling that leads to TFEB modulation and nuclear, uh, nuclear enrichment. So we are pursuing those, but I think it's more a, a, maybe a response of the system to a loss of the ability of the system to do endosomal cycling and, and lysosomal biogenesis. Uh, and they might actually go through mTOR. Um, but we haven't really looked at the dynamics and the change there. It might be important here. Okay, thank you. Um, and by the way, the people who ask questions, if you want to pursue your question, you can send in another comment through the Q&A. Um, so Mitch McVeigh has two questions which are sort of related, both about XPO1. I'm gonna ask if XPO1 inhibition synergizes with, rap, with rapamycin for healthy lifespan um, or health span. And similarly, yes, if, um, 
anybody or Rob looked at the ability of XPL1 inhibition to extend lifespan in wild type or other lifespan compromised Drosophila besides the SOD1 mutant? So there's two questions about XPL1. Yes, so we haven't done the study in wild type. At the time, you know, we were trying to look for a model that was short-lived and that we could see any changes. Um, you know, as you can see, if I did those lifespan in Drosophila in that study, I might have got scooped. <laughs> but, uh, but it's a, definitely a question that we want to address. Obviously, we're interested, you know, down the road to uh, bring those, to, uh, those compounds to per perhaps an intervention program to look into mice to see if there's any, any lifespan extension. As far as whether rapamycin and XP1 would synergize, it's a good question. You know, we, we're trying to, to, to not play too much with mTOR in that, in that context because of potential side effect, although it's always debatable wh whether that's, that's true for rapamycin. Uh, it's probably, again, context dependent on who's the patient uh, population and, and whether they can benefit from it. Um, but that's, that's definitely a question. I mean, if, if they were additive, that means that there are other components of the mTOR pathway we're not hitting with XP1 inhibition. But what we think is happening, especially looking at uh, the nucleocytoplasmic uh, partitioning when you inhibit XP1, is that a very much of a global proteostatic change that might overlap with what mTOR is doing. Okay, thank you. Um, whoops, questions are flowing in. Um, I think I just lost one of them. Um, as it went off of my screen. Uh, Henry Waters, also from our Healthy Aging Community and Leadership Group, um, ask is, are, are there orthologs of C-gas and sting in C. elegans? Um, they're known to regulate autophagy in mammals. Do they play similar roles in C. elegans? And do they regulate lifespan? I haven't looked. That's a really good, I know, I know these studies have been coming down the pipe and uh, it's, it's hot stuff. Yeah, I probably should look. Um, Eloy Bejarano from our group asked if SQST1-1 overexpression. Um, does not over extend lifespan. What about health span? Is it possible that other autophagic receptors can compensate or lack uh, for the lack of overexpression of uh, SQST1, it's P62? That's, that's a good question. I mean, the way I would see it, you know, with the overexpression is that it just burdens the system. One way to rescue that might be to enhance lysosomal biogenesis concomitantly. Uh, for the fact that we also see an impact of the loss of SQSC1, in particular in the wild type, the question is here would be what is it mediating as far as cargo selection that is important in the wild type that we typically don't see in the DAF2 animals. And so one possibility is that the wild type is more subjected to ribophagy at higher temperature, and that's, that's um, requiring SQSC1 to be functional there. But we, we're, you know, very aggressively looking at that possibility of, of the ripophagy receptor at this point. Thank you. Now, I have a question. Um, since I think I've covered most of the audience and I don't want to occupy too much of your time, although I have been. Um, so we've seen effects on, on mean lifespan and maximal lifespan, right? In, in some cases, the drugs or the various genetic manipulations have effects on both mean and maximal lifespan. In other cases, they don't affect maximal lifespan, they just affect mean lifespan. Um, and I'm wondering if you can dissect out effects early in life, I think effects on mean lifespan would imply that there are certain effects earlier in life and certain effects later in life, right? Expending lifespan per se. Um, I'm wondering if you've been able to dissect these processes and been able to identify processes that are happening earlier and other processes that are more important later. Yes, I think this, this is right in the middle of the action, I think, in the field is to be able to parse these out because they might be, and I think some labs have been uh, publishing studies, for example, in the context of autophagy, that at some point in life, later in life, maybe that's not a good thing to have too much of it, maybe related again to the fact that if you do that, you might be burdening uh, the system or sensitizing the system to a proteome that's not as stable as it was before. Um, one thing that we can tell is that if you knock down XPO1 later in life, it's not as potent as it is early in life. And I think it's in line with the idea, and I think Andy Dillon, whose postdoc work was suggesting that, is that there's a timing requirement for these longevity systems, is that you need to uh, 
initialize the nuclear translocation of these transcription factor early to get the right transcriptional signature. And the maintenance of that might be important down in life as well. But definitely doing that early in life during a reproductive stage does have a, a better impact. And that might speak to, uh, again, a germline to soma signaling that needs to be uh, loaded up early. In, but if you, uh, what's interesting with XP1 is if you knock it down during development, you completely, uh, uh, actually, you get a really short lifespan. So it speaks to this antagonistic pleiotropy where you have a protein that's involved and it's really important in developing the animal. But when it gets into adulthood, it becomes dispensable. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, and, and I think this reflects on a question that I now see come up on my screen from Carney Babakian, um, who asked uh, about um, trying to apply the findings and, and maybe the interventions to extend lifespan. And I would sort of add to that question, um, are there times like when you think some of these drugs might have to be used to gain the benefits that you talk about? And there may be times when it's just inappropriate to use them. You know, do we have to intervene early on before a disease really takes major effect or has a major compromise? Yes, and, and, and also goes back to a different school of thoughts as to uh, whether you want to affect, for example, stem cell regeneration, or at some point during age, you want to be in a situation where you're playing with the cards you've been dealt, and you, whatever cells you have in there, you just have to make them more resilient to proteostatic decline. I think our approach might be more for the latter, because if you're, you know, if you're affecting XP1, you might be affecting proliferation of cells that maybe during a uh, youth or a development uh, but before you reach adulthood, that might not be a, such a good idea. But uh, when, you know, again, uh, the stage is set and, and there's not a ton of cell proliferation, maybe XP01 inhibition becomes more of an interesting approach. But yes, definitely timing is probably everything here and dose yeah. as well. Yeah, I think these are crucial questions because I suppose most people won't take a drug anticipating that they're going to get old, but when they get old, you know, then it may be too late. <laughs> so you have to find that sweet spot of, of, of timing to, to make these drugs effective. Yeah, and I think we've, we've been exploring the idea of senescence as well to see if these drugs have implication in senescence. So this is something really new in our lab, but we have good collaborator here at Brown to work on that. But uh, definitely a hot feel, I think, to, to decide whether or not, instead of killing those senescent cells that create SASP, we're actually making them more resilient and less uh, inflammatory. Right. Now, can I have a specific question which sort of, I think, ties back into the comments you were just making toward the end about the interactions of the ubiquitin pathway. What, what's known about toxicity, specific toxicity of ubiquitin conjugates? I think it, it from... In other words, ubiquitination, right, is absolutely required to bring a protein to degradation or maybe to traffic it. But maybe ubiquitination without degradation leads to toxicity. And I'm wondering if, if, if people have done sort of the equivalent of the Morimoto experiments with Q29 and above, you know, causing toxicity. Have people done the same kind of thing with uh, X amount of ubiquitin and above? Right. That's, that's, a really, that's a really great question. I think we're, we're right at the cusp of understanding this to an extent. Uh, I think if you if you think about the work by Art Hulrich on DAF2 uh, aggregation versus wild type aggregation, they're suggesting and that's I think it's a five year old study. They're suggesting that the aggregation that happens in wild type animal is different than DAF2, the type of protein that aggregate, but also the amount of chaperones that these aggregates have. So in DAF2, there's a lot more chaperoning of these aggregates. That might actually reduce the amount of ubiquitination, and that might even make them unsensitive to the system. So, and that, that's in line with what we see with SQST1. If SQST1 doesn't need to be involved if the proteins are not ubiquitinated, if they're well chaperoned, they're stabilized. So there, and, and that's, I think that's in line with some of the work related to Alzheimer's disease, for example, where we think of plaque as being detrimental, but maybe if they're well chaperoned and, and secluded, they might not be toxic per se. And so there's a lot of people with reasonable cognitive function that our brain is full of plaques. Good. Well, thank you so much. I think I don't want to exhaust you anymore. The, the seminar has been a wonderful tour. 
And I think Roger Fielding is going to come back on now and tell us about future seminars and concluding remarks. Yes, uh, thank you again, Dr. LaPierre, for an excellent seminar and um, from the uh, Healthy Aging at Tufts Priority Area Research Group. We really appreciate you spending some time with us today and uh, for your excellent seminar. Um, we have one final seminar um, in our Healthy Aging at Tufts series, which will be in December, and the date escapes me. Maybe Andrea can come on and tell me the date. December 11th, which that is also a Friday. Deep Dixit uh, from Yale, is that correct? Yes. Correct. And so that will be December 11th, same time. So again, thank you all for joining us today, and have a pleasant afternoon. Bye-bye.